The topic of my talk is how to put algorithms inside neural networks. I am very excited about this topic because of, mainly because it allows to bridge, to build bridges between classical computer science and machine learning. And to relate a bit with the previous talk, that's roughly what Joao did in the first half. So he used a lot of expertise in SLAM, which is a classical, let's put it this way, classical computer vision discipline, and expertise in neural networks, refined those together, and boom, new state-of-the-art system for SLAM built on neural networks. So today I'm going to tell you uh, about the principles, how this kind of things could be done, a bit more generally. So let's move on. First, the, the easy part, uh, a bit of motivation. Why, why do we need to talk about neural networks? That's very easy, because uh, just results speak for, uh, for themselves. In, in many fields, uh, neural networks are the state of the art, and that's the reality we have to live in. For example, computer vision. Such tasks as uh, image classification, uh, object detection, image segmentation, as of today, are solved almost exclusively with neural networks. And if you want to build a system for one of these tasks without neural networks, you'd better have a very good reason to do that. So it's, it's very hard to imagine one. Okay, so that's, that, that's computer vision. But neural networks are used not only in computer vision. Some other fields, like natural language processing. Uh, I think since 2014, Google Translate has moved from, uh, from symbolic um, automatic translation system, which was developed for like 20 years, not 20, 10 years before, to system based on neural networks. And they gave, and this provided a great boost in result, which is, like, uh, which is why they migrated. Another thing, sorry that's in Russian, but I'm just showing you to, to show that not only Google, but, company, but uh, companies in other countries also do neural networks, and that's, um, and that's uh, automatic assistant, which you speak to and which provides a response in back. And that's a Russian version coming from Yandex, which is Russian Google. Okay, and so all, all companies that do stuff like, that, that do products like that, now use a lot of neural networks. So that was NLP and final, final field, field, which I personally don't know anything about, but I still, I'm still talking about it. That's audio processing. So such applications as speech synthesis based on text, music generation, and uh, of course, like speech recognition, are solved uh, based on neural networks largely today. So having, uh, a lot, having seen a lot of successes of NETs, it's very general to, to to use them for any applications which relate uh, any data like that. Okay, so that was the easy part, motivating neural networks. That's, that's, I, I hope uh, uh, that's, I succeeded here. So, next step. Why, why do we want to put algorithm in, in neural nets? Why, why, why do we want to do that? So first, uh, for many tasks, we do have good networks. So they actually work, but for, for uh, these architectures that work well are often built of decades of research on their own, and it's, uh, it's very hard to build new architectures for new tasks. So if you have uh, a new task coming, uh, you can take your favorite architecture from existing tasks, but there are no real guarantees that it will work. It might work, but it might not work. It depends. At the same time, uh, like another thing which is uh, very important is that as of today, neural nets cannot just learn everything. It's not that like you throw data at them and they just give you results. So often they need help in a sense of either smart engineering of architecture or some very uh, strong levels of supervision, but they need, uh, often they need help. Uh, but that's, that's where, like, uh, like when build, in, at the same time, in many tasks, like we already have uh, powerful algorithms that work. So like, uh, like uh, in Joao's case, slum systems that existed before and they were producing like reasonable results. So one very natural idea is not to throw away the existing systems when trying to use neural networks, but try to combine things and try to build things together to use the power that already works, something uh, that works, like uh, existing algorithms, and uh, enrich them with neural networks. So what can we get by doing this? So we can view we can look at this from the two sides. First, if you are like a neural network person, you can think about this as building new layers and new architectures for neural networks. So you are enriching your library of layers, which, can, which is beneficial. More layers, the more layers, the better. 
And if you are a computer science, like a, a person who doesn't like neural network, but who works with algorithms from computer science on any task, you can view, view look at this as uh, making your algorithm trainable. You had your system, which was like hand designed, but then you can uh, declare some parts of it as uh, free parameters, and then just learn them, improve them given the data, given the data you have. Okay. Uh, so that was my motivation. Let's move on to the actual content on the talk, and that's what uh, I'm going to talk to you. So, I'll, I'll, so there is no any like specific theory in all of this, but I'll uh, go over three particular approaches which which have worked in several use cases each, and which were successful for exactly the the topic, like putting algorithms into networks. The first one is something I call structured pooling of activations. It's, uh, it's that um, uh, in this approach, we use a powerful combinatorial optimization methods to pick the right activations and to pull over them later. The second ap approach uh, uh, is unrolling iterations of, uh, of algorithms into layers of networks. So basically, you put all the operations of the algorithms, uh, then you convert them into layers, which is very easy with the modern autograd uh, systems, and then you just interpret that as a one giant neural network and uh, use the neural network techniques for that. And uh, the final approach is analytical, or maybe not really analytical, but algorithmic differentiation with respect to the input of the algorithm. This is a bit more interesting and tricky, but we'll get into that uh, a bit later. So for First two approaches, I'll be using this running example to illustrate the, the methods um, I'm talking about. So what is this? This is the simplified task of uh, optical character recognition. So as input, we are given a sequence of images. Each of them has a latent letter. Like here, like we have a command. And the output is a, a recognized uh, word consisting of the symbols. Uh, so these tasks can be viewed as a, as a amnist of structured prediction. In a sense, this is a very simple task. Almost any approach would work, and that's why it's uh, convenient to use uh, to illustrate like different kinds of approaches. And importantly, in this task, it's very important to use structure. Because, like, because of the handwriting abilities of the people who created this data set, some letters are simply not recognizable on their own, and uh, it's just whatever classify your train, it's just impossible to recognize. So if you take like the state-of-the-art uh, networks for MNIST and train them to classify each symbol individually, you get around 8% error, which is uh, kind of very high if you look at this from MNIST uh, standard. But that's the property of the data. It's just there is no way around this. Uh, at least uh, I don't know about anything. But if you start using structure, there are many approaches to do that. But if you use like any reasonable approach to use structure, your error immediately drops down to 1% to 3% error. So the gap between this and this is kind of, can be interpreted as a, um, as a measure of how useful structure is in this data. So here it's like quite a lot. That's why it's an interesting example for specifically recognizing symbols jointly. OK. Uh, so uh, we'll start with a classifier that just uh, classifies all letters independently. And this here will be like nothing special. It's just a Lenet for OCR, like MNIST type network. So what does this network consist of? So first, it has linear operations with parameters. So at the first layer, those are like convolutions. At the final layers, we'll, we'll, those are like fully connected uh, or affine layers. Then uh, the network has nonlinearities, which are sigmoid or relu. It's not, not that important here. Then we have pooling operations, which are specific layers that, choose, that pick activations among uh, sets of activations uh, which come before. And overall, the system is trained by, uh, minim by, by applying stochastic minimization to um, cross entropy loss. And the, the, the gradients with respect to all the parameters are computed with a backpropagation algorithm. So this is like the, this, the most standard pipeline for neural networks that one can imagine. Okay, let's look a bit at the pooling operations that are already uh, in this model. You can, view, you can look at pooling as a, already an algorithm. So for example, if, you, if uh, you pull over a large number of activations with, uh, say, max pooling, then computing ma maximum over a large number can be non-trivial on its own. And uh, that's why you, you might need some fancy algorithm. 
But also, you know, the, the usual type of spooling are max, max or average pooling, but one is not restricted to using them. You can use something more interesting, say like a quantile, you can use a cave best uh, activation, or you can use a median, or you can uh, sort your activations in some, uh, say, in a scanning order, and use the average of the top 20%. Like, why not? So you can do that. I'm not saying you should do it, but you can do it. So when you see this, the natural question you might ask is, uh, can we actually train with this? Is this differentiable? Because the whole routine on training networks is, relies on the fact that we can do backpropagation. And here we have like a different uh, um, complication in uh, uh, naming these things. So people, of, in the, the people related to neural networks often use word differentiable for something which is not differentiable. What we actually need is uh, something like backpropable, which is like a weaker notion of differentiability in a sense. We can do backprop. If we can do backprop, then we don't care about if it is differentiable or not. And this type of operations, they, they are not differentiable, but they are backpropable in a sense. In, in a way, like uh, Max is uh, backpropable. So they pick certain activations and then at the backward stage, you can ignore where this, um, how you've picked these activations, and then just do, just propagate your gradients into the activations you've picked. So, and that exactly leads us to the first approach, the structured pooling, like a complicated way of pooling activations. Let's see how this works. So we have our network, which processes, processes input layer by layer. Then we have our fancy algorithm inside which is a black box. We don't really know what's inside. We don't care. Network doesn't care what's inside. Then the, we have uh, the output of the algorithm. It goes into further layers and finally into the loss. So now, how do we backpropagate within this approach? Uh, a specific property of this approach is that uh, to do backpropagation, you don't need the actual algorithm. You only need its result. So basically, after having run the algorithm at the forward path, you just save the result. And when doing the backward pass, you use this result to compute the gradient. Like when backpropagating through maximum operation, you just use the position of maximum and backpropagate there. And you don't really care how you computed this maximum. So the set of, uh, so that's exact, um, so I refer to the set of approaches which can run backward pass this way as a, like structured pooling. So let's look uh, at a specific example, how this can be implemented in a somewhat interesting setting. So again, our mm, simplified uh, character recognition task. So basically, uh, to, to illustrate this, we will use an old conditional random field model, which is a way to define interactions between labels. So this whole model is based on a score function, which gives a score, which computes a score for complete labelings, for sequences of uh, symbols. A score function looks like this. So here, f is a score function, Y is a sequence of uh, labels, the whole, the whole word. X is input uh, data, which, uh, which is a sequence of images. And theta are parameters. So if we, we pose no restriction on the score function, that it's a giant tensor and very high dimensional, and it's hard to work with uh, directly. But if, if we add specific restrictions, uh, if we assume how the score function looks like, then we can work with it efficiently. Specifically, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to assume that the score function can be, is defined as a sum of uh, unary potentials and pairwise potentials. So unary potentials are functions that depend only on one, lay, on one position of the output. You can view, look at them, you can think about them as the outputs of the classifier at the, of this particular letter. Uh, so we are taking one image as input and produce a score per each, we produce 26 scores, one for each possible uh, letter at this position. And pairwise, uh, pairwise potentials uh, are there to, deco to, to, code, uh, to, to encode interactions between neighboring labels. So the simplest way to define them is to use a 26 by 26 matrix, which tells you uh, how often one symbol goes after another symbol. So like uh, in position, which corresponds to symbols A and B, it, it, it illustrates how often symbol B goes after symbol A. Okay, so having defined this, uh, 
So basically, if you're familiar with graphical models, which is kind of old school topic, this is a chain-like graphical model, and it, it is known for like being very simple in the sense that uh, almost any combinatorial operation that you might want to do, you can do it. There are efficient algorithms for them. And this, are, this is exactly what we are going to use next. But if you are not familiar with graphical models, never mind, uh, like, uh, it it's not, doesn't really matter. Don't worry. Okay. So basically, having defined this function, uh, this, uh, it does not uh, provide the answer to the problem we are going to solve. It does not pro provide a labeling. Uh, uh, does not provide an output word. So basically, we, we need to, some way to extract a labeling from this function. How can we do it? The simplest possible way, I guess, is to just find the labeling which delivers the maximum value of the score. Basically, maximize this function with respect to all y's, with respect to all uh, outputs. Note that this operation cannot be. Uh, this operation is hard because it requires a maximization over uh, a lot of labelings, which is 26 to the length of the sequence, which is intractable directly. But because of the specific structure of the score function, we can use algorithms to. Uh, to, to find this maximum. Specifically, we are going to use dynamic programming, which, is, which, is, which has a name, a specific name for this case. It's a, is known as the Viterbi algorithm. So the algorithm consists in iteratively computing the Bellman function, which is, uh, looks like that. So basically, the semantics of this function is, uh, so, so basically, at the position i plus 1 uh, of uh, label uh, y i plus 1, uh, this function contains the maximum value of the score of partial score, which uh, relates to all the summons with indices uh, less or equal than y, such that uh, the, last, uh, the last label is uh, y uh, i plus 1. So basically, and uh, this function can be computed uh, step by step for all the sequence. And importantly, like uh, compute computation of this function contains maximization with respect to only one label and not the whole sequence. And that's exactly the reduction that allows to do all the trick, that, that allows to solve the problem in the polynomial time. Finally, after we've computed all these uh, functions, we can find the optimal value by taking the maximum with respect to uh, uh, with respect to the, the, the maximum of this function of this uh, Bellman functions at the last position with respect to the labels. After we have computed their, uh, the maximum value of the score, we can retrieve the optimal configuration by using uh, parent pointers. This is, this is just following the arg maximum position, uh, the positions of the arg max here, some backward path of uh, dynamic programming, in other words. OK, so now I have described a way how to extract, how, which algorithm we can use to extract the maximum uh, value of the score function and to make a prediction given the score function. Now, let's move to the machine learning part. How do we learn this uh, score function? How do we set it up in such a way that this maximum is, uh, provides the answer we want, gives a good prediction? So let's look at this as a standard supervised uh, learning task. We assume that we have a label training set where we have a where each data point contains a sequence of uh, images, of letters, and the uh, annotation, which is a word, a sequence of letters. We are going to do the learning by optimizing the loss function, uh, over, which is uh, an average of, uh, over our data points of the, uh, the training objective. So basically, like, uh, to relate to structured pooling, we will use a specific training objective, which is called uh, structured SVM. So for those who know what SVM are, this is just a generalization of uh, SVM to structured outputs. Uh, this the, the, this uh, loss function looks, reads as follows. So uh, what, let's look what we have here. So here we have our score function defined over different configuration, and we are doing maximization with respect to different configurations. Let's ignore this for now. Uh, and uh, with a negative sign, we have the score function at the correct, correct labeling. So basically, uh, it, say, if the maximum of our score function is achieved at the, at the correct labeling, and that's what we want, 
then the value of the whole objective will be zero because uh, we will have uh, f at uh, correct labeling here minus f at correct labeling here. But if, <coughs> if the maximum is achieved at a different configuration, then we will have, uh, then this, this uh, objective will have uh, a positive value, and the larger, the, the larger this value is, the, the further away the score at the correct configuration is from the score at the maximum position. So the goal of training is to minimize this, to make sure that the maximum is achieved at, their, at the correct position. So having defined this uh, score function, this, this uh, objective function, let's look uh, in details how the training algorithm will look like. Uh, so we are, we are doing this within a stochastic optimization framework, so I'll, I'll show you the steps of one iteration of stochastic optimization. So basically the first step is to compute these potentials. Those potentials are uh, coming from neural networks, so we, we are doing the forward pass over neural, net, neural networks, and this gives us all the, all the values, all the theta, which are used to define the score function. After we have this, we can compute the objective. We can run our dynamic programming algorithm to compute this max and to get all the values here and to get the arg max as well. So after this, we can compute the gradients of the, of the, of, of the final objective with respect to the potentials. Because now for us, for us this, uh, this, the, the max is already computed, we have uh, arg max position there, so we can use the same approach that is used to differentiate the max, just back propagate inside the, the positions which are already selected like, by this uh, dynamic programming. And when we have the gradients with respect to the potentials, we can use the standard back propagation approach to compute the gradients with respect to neural network parameters. So basically, uh, that part nowadays is automatic, like Autograd does this, that for us. And after we run backprop, we can do a step of an optimizer to, uh, to learn, to do a step of learning with respect to our parameters. So in a, essentially, this pipeline is very similar to the standard pipeline of uh, neural networks, uh, of training net, net, net neural networks. The only difference is that uh, the step of computing the loss might be complicated in a sense that it requires running the algorithm, which in our example is uh, dynamic programming. Also, like uh, an important point is that within this approach, the only thing we need uh, to, from this algorithm is to be able to run it, which means that connection between the system where neural network is implemented and the system where the algorithm is implemented is very weak. We just need to run one thing from another and get the result. It means that uh, those two can be implemented in different systems, in different languages, in different languages and even on, run, can, can be run on different hardware. So if you have your existing solution, which does your dynamic programming or like a, a way more fancy algorithm specialized to your task, then you can just stick this solution with a neural network and that will work. You just need to be able to call your algorithm from a network and nothing more. You don't need to integrate those together uh, properly. So to give some examples of where this approach has been used, uh, so, so here, are, here are a few. So basically first is the task of free text recognition. It's a generalization of our toy task to more real world scenario where the input is an image of text and it's, it's not parsed into individual letters and parsing into letters is a part of the task. But the job, what we need to do is the same thing, is to recognize all the, all the letters, all the symbols in there on this image. So, and this, 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 uh, this task was uh, uh, the, the state of the art method for, the, for this task uh, of that time was based exactly on this idea. It was using neural network to compute features f uh, from the image, and then this was combined with structured SVM, uh, and the, in, underneath there was a loss function which was optimized with uh, dynamic programming. Another example uh, task where this was used is the detecting of uh, multiple objects. For example, in this task, uh, they were detecting uh, human heads on movie frames, 
And in movies, human heads are very often in very specific positions with respect to each other. So one can use this information to help a detector on heads which are hard to detect. Say, like, faces are easy to detect, but back of the head is much harder. And thus, those uh, could help each other, but by using the structured model defined with respect to all the possible detections on the model. And the final example of uh, where this was applied is the task of image tagging. So this is like the task of classification by where, can you, where you can assign multiple classes to an image. And uh, specifically in this task, usually the set of possible classes is very large. So uh, something, uh, so there might be not, even, not enough information in the data for some of the classes. And it appears that using uh, a structured model uh, defined on classes can help detecting, say, rare classes which, are not, uh, which, which cannot be learned on their own. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about the structured pooling. So now I'll move on to the second approach, uh, second approach to combining networks and uh, algorithms. So this, uh, I refer to this approach as enrolling iterations into layers. So what, what does this mean? It means that uh, at the forward pass, we have uh, the same pipeline, our network uh, uh, computes layer by layer given the input, then this goes to the algorithm. And differently from the previous approach, now we cannot use, this approach doesn't use this algorithm as a black box, we need to open the black box, we need to take all the operations of this algorithm, interpret them as a layers of a neural network, uh, and plug those into a neural network. And then the output of the algorithm goes to the loss. So uh, having done this, we can, the backpropagation becomes the job of the, our automatic differentiation in the sense that this is just from uh, the system point of view, this is just a giant neural network and the autograd should do all the backprop, should do all the operations. So important difference from the previous approach is that now our algorithm has to be uh, very integrated with the neural network system, which, means, which probably means that it has to be implemented in the, in the same library as, their, uh, as the neural network itself, which probably means that you cannot use your old implementations, which comes from uh, somewhere else. Those have to be implemented uh, in a way compatible with the neural networks, with the autograd. Okay, so let's see a specific example how this can work on the same task. Uh, learning uh, potentials of a conditional random field for uh, character recognition. So we are going to be in exactly the same approach, uh, in exactly the same setting. So we have a label training set where we are given features and labels, and we will be minimizing an objective function. Uh, the only difference with the previous uh, previous example is that we are going to use a different objective function. Instead of structured uh, SVM, we'll be using a maximum likelihood approach for training. So what does this mean? It means that given the, the, the same score function as we have before, we, are defi we will define a probability over all the labelings. We'll do this in a very simple way by taking exponent of all the scores and normalizing. And given this a probability model over all the outputs, we can take a negative log of this, and this is our neg and get a negative, uh, negative log likelihood objective. So the catch with this, uh, the complication in computing this objective lies in, the, in computing the, the z, the normalizing constant, or the partition function, as it's referred in physics. Uh, the problem here is that the this uh, normalizing constant uh, requires summation over all the labelings, and there are exponentially many of them. In the previous approach, we were doing maximization over all the labelings, and here we need uh, to do summation over all the labelings. Mm -hmm. So compute, because there are exponentially many of them, we cannot mm, compute this sum directly and something smart has to be done. Fortunately, by using, we, can, we can use the same structure of the score function we were using before and there is an algorithm that can do this efficiently. So what this will, will algorithm be? This will be again dynamic programming but uh, with a different flavor and this is called the sum product uh, dynamic programming. So, uh, as any dynamic programming, this will be iteratively computing the Bellman function again. The only difference from the previous algorithm is that all the sum operations are substituted with the product and all the max operations are substituted with the sum. So, it's just a literal uh, conversion of one operations to another. And all the rest is the same. 
And uh, uh, after we compute this Bellman function for all the positions of the sequence, we can get the result by just summing up the values of the Bellman function at the last position. Note that uh, this, is, uh, this algorithm is a finite set of steps of all the, which contains operations that are all simple and differentiable. So the only things we have here is an exponent, product, and summation, and that's it. This means that all these operations can be interpreted as layers of neural networks directly taken and stuck into Autograd system, and uh, Autograd will do all the backpropagation. There, no, there are no tricks, so no tricks here. Okay, uh, so this approach was used, uh, so, well, not directly, but uh, this approach was a basis for building a state-of-the-art image segmentation system, which uh, was dealing with the uh, dense CRF models, which were like graphical models like that, where all the pixels were connecting with each other. And the approach was very competitive at the time and was producing uh, state-of-the-art results. Of course, combined with a neural network. So this was like a graphical model stuck, added on top of a state-of-the-art neural network, uh, convolutional neural net for processing images. Okay. So what I've shown you uh, is an algorithm where, which, is, which has finite number of steps and uh, allows you to, to exactly compute the output given the input. But uh, this is not a necessary requirement for applying such a technique. In the next example, we will have an iterative algorithm, which is like an optimization algorithm which never actually ends. And uh, we can just end it at some point and uh, use uh, what is computed as an output and stick that into a neural network. Let's look uh, at the example. So this is the task of image denoising. So here, uh, the input is a noisy image, and we want to have a clean image as an output. So this, uh, the only way to get this task, to solve this task, is to use uh, some prior information about how clean images look like, what, what's to disambiguate noise and images. And computer vision community has spent a lot of research, has done a lot of research on how to define these models, these prior over natural images, but it appeared to be a very hard task and very, uh, basically, not solved at all. So here, the natural idea came, let's try to learn this model. Let's use one of the successful approach for denoising uh, from before, then add learnable parameters to it and try to train those on real data. And that's exactly what this uh, paper did. So it, 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 uh, it, it built on the standard approach to image denoising, which, which consisted in minim minimizing the following objective function. So there are two terms here. One terms, uh, one, the first term says how close is the noisy image to the clean image, uh, because we, the, the output should be similar to the input image. We cannot output like a random natural image. We, we, we don't want a very good natural image which is not related to the input. That's not the goal. And so they basically this term does exactly this. And the second term is exactly a prior over the image x, and it encodes how natural this image is. And so here, like matrices L are parameters, and we want to learn these parameters from data, uh, to, and we want to learn them in such a way that minimum of this uh, function will be, like, will be natural looking and close to y. Uh, so in computer, uh, so th this optimization problem is not that easy on its own, but there, there, are, success there, there are successful methods developed exactly for minimizing such objective function. Uh, this paper specifically built on the proximal gradient optimization algorithm to get uh, this minimum. The, here I've, uh, I've put the step of this algorithm. So uh, let's look uh, what's, what's there. Uh, so basically, if you don't know what proximal gradient is, uh, it doesn't matter. So basically, that's just the, our up the, the update formula. So let's trust the, the authors of the paper on that. So basically, what's here? This is just a linear operation with respect to the, it, the previous it, the iterate at iteration t minus 1 and uh, the input. Then we have matrix multiplication of the previous iterate and our parameters. Then there is some nonlinear function, phi, psi, and there is multiple multiplication based on the, on the matrices transposed, and that's it. This is the projection operator projection on this uh, box. So this projection operator is not differentiable, but backpropable, so like, it can be easily stuck in neural networks the same way as any other 
most other non-differentiable operations. And having, after we see, we've seen this equation, let's look how this is put into a neural network. And this is a scheme of a neural network, which is a literate translation of this, uh, of this formula into the neural network language. So basically we have our iterate, then this m multiplication by a matrix of parameters is done by a convolution, so these matrices are defined such that multiplication on the matrix is a convolution. Then this function psi is an element-wise nonlinearity. Then multiplication on the transpose matrix is uh, not surprisingly like convolution transpose, so uh, also a typical operation. And all the rest are just linear operations, like uh, this uh, summation with weights, then like minus, summation, and like box projection here. So it appears that ha having built that, we can just stack many, uh, many blocks like this, and this, uh, uh, this corresponds to many iterations of a proximal gradient. So uh, to train this, we can just define a loss function. So we are basically, the loss function is kind of already there. We can just minimize this uh, by a stochastic gradient descent. So note that uh, proximal gradient is an iterative algorithm, and uh, we can run it forever. It, it's supposed to go closer and closer to the, to, the, to the optimum. But like we cannot do an infinite number of layers with neural networks, so we have to de decide where to stop. So usually this, uh, this is done in a simple way by just saying how many iterations we want to do in advance. Defining number of iterations <coughs> given the data is a hard task, and uh, usually people don't do that. But say, we can say that we want to do like five iterations of this, then just stack those, and that's our neural network, which we, which we can train with the backpropagation. Okay, so to illustrate the results of this algorithm, so basically that's the, that's the original image, that's the image with noise, but, and that's the result. Uh, so basically it's, very, it's always very hard to show the results of the denoising algorithm because the quality of projectors is uh, often not good enough so, so that uh, pe people can see like, the, the images. But the slides will be there, will be online at some point, so you'll be able to examine the, these images more closely and see that uh, the result is closer to the original, the clean image, than the noisy image. And here, from here, from my point of view, I can't see the difference, but I'm not sure for all of you, so <laughs> let's just move on. Okay, so basically that's all I wanted to say about the second approach to, uh, to putting algorithms into networks, which was uh, unrolling iterations of algorithm into neural network layers. So the third approach is an analytical or algorithmic derivative with respect to the input. So basically, uh, uh, what's the gist of this approach? So basically the forward pass is the same. We are the same as before. We are running our network with the algorithm inside as a black box. But to do the, the, backward, the backward pass, we don't do anything with the algorithm, but we derive another box, like a purple box, which is supposed to compute the gradient for this algorithm. So uh, the, uh, the first and obvious drawback of this approach is that this purple box has to be created to begin with. So there is extra work that has to be done to implement this. But if this is done, then uh, the result of this approach is, uh, usually provides the most efficient implementations, which are the fastest ones and the most memory efficient. And this, in, this is the way which is typically used to add new layers to the libraries by library cr creators. They, they get people who know the algorithm very well, and those, they derive analytical or algorithmic uh, solutions to get the derivatives directly. Let's see an example of how this uh, could be done. So for that, uh, I'm first I will use again a CRF example. This will be Gaussian CRF for image segmentation. So sorry, not this is not easily applicable for simple recognition for OCR, but for image segmentation that works well. So this is a CRF, so it's based on a score function as well. But now this core function is defined with respect to continuous variables. So, so basically y uh, is a vector of uh, variables and each variable corresponds to a pixel of the image. Let's say all binary uh, zero and, uh, in the segment zero and one, where zero corresponds to background and one to the foreground, to the object. So basically this is a quadratic function. Uh, so, uh, 
and the parameters live in matrix in the matrix A and in the vector B. So uh, matrix A corresponds to pairwise potentials, which are the interactions between different pixels, and uh, vector the vector B corresponds to unary potentials, which uh, tells you how likely uh, this pixel is the background or foreground. So the, the final the, the, uh, uh, with this score function, the solution is extracted from it in the same way as before by taking the maximum with respect to variables. As this is a quadratic function, then the maximum can be computed easily by just solving uh, a system of linear equations, just differentiating this uh, with respect to y and uh, setting the gradient to zero and gives us a system of linear equations. This can be solved and the solution is there in the closed form, just matrix inverse of the vector B. Let's see, uh, let, let's pose, now let's pose the task of differentiation of this solution with respect to the parameters. That's what we want to do in, in, within a network. So for this task, what's our input? Our input is, uh, consists in parameters which are matrix A and uh, vector B. Then we have our solution, which we have already computed at the forward pass. So basically this solution, th this equation uh, provides the solution of the system, which we do at the forward pass uh, of the network. And basically we have this solution as input, and also we have a gradient of the loss with respect to our solution, with respect to output. And th th those are the inputs of the task of differentiation. As an output, we want to compute the gradients of the loss with respect to our parameters, which are the vector B and the matrix A, in this case. And because all of this is just linear algebra, uh, we can do all the manipulations we want here. We can, of course, compute the, this gradients in a, in a closed form. Okay, so it's supposed to be minus here, but uh, it's not being displayed. But anyway, so th there is a closed form solution for all the gradients. And if we implement uh, this uh, this, uh, this computation in a forward pass, and those computation separately to do the backward pass, that gives us exactly the, the combination of the black box for forward pass and purple box for the backward pass. So those are the two. So th this one is a bit more simplistic example, just solving a system of linear equations as an algorithm. But uh, same things uh, have been done for way more complicated operations. Uh, for example, consider SVD decomposition, which is a standard routine in, in many f arises in many different applications. And uh, computing this efficiently and robustly is uh, quite a task, and I don't recommend anyone uh, except experts in numerical linear algebra like uh, implementing this on their own. But uh, it appears that uh, if we have computed the solution, uh, there are explicit formulas that can get us the derivatives. Those are, of course, like complicated formulas. I'm not ex expecting you to parse those exactly. I'm just showing you those. Uh, to, the, the only thing I want you to notice is there are, there are no complicated operations here. It's just uh, matrix products. Uh, this is the element-wise product, matrix transposes, summation, and that's it. Nothing, nothing which can't be implemented. And so basically, the creators of... Uh, neural network packages like TensorFlow and PyTorch, they basically do this. They implement forward passes to compute this, implement the algorithms themselves, and they add extra, uh, extra operations to compute all the gradients. And that's how they get a differentiable SVD into the library. Okay, so this, uh, this technique can be applied beyond linear algebra to other uh, in other cases as well. For example, uh, it can be also applied in submodal optimization, and the surpri surprising thing is that submodal optimization is a discrete optimization problem. But nevertheless, uh, one can use an equivalence, uh, known equivalence between discrete and continuous optimization problems, and then define, and then use the continuous optimization problem to get the derivatives with respect to solution of the discrete problems. And of course, like underneath, 
uh, and in, uh, under the hood of these uh, layers, they use very special. Uh, they use algorithms which are specialized to submodel optimization, but which are known in the field of submodel optimization. So uh, there is nothing new for submodel optimization here. It's just uh, of the authors of this paper picked these algorithms and plugged those into neural network. And here we come. We have a differentiable submodular optimization layer. Another very interesting example is. Uh, or using ordinary differential equations as layers into neural network. By the way, that was a best paper award at the NeurIPS last year, so that's a, like a breakthrough in the field in some sense. So basically, what, what, what they've noticed, they've noticed that there is a lot of literature on solving ordinary differential equations, and basically one can, this literature kind of suggests how to compute the gradient with respect to the solution of the uh, ODE. And the way to do this is to solve another ODE. So that allow, if you know how to solve ODEs well, and if you have all the toolboxes for that, then you can just stack those into networks and then uh, learn parameters of ODE with the neural network techniques, which uh, sounds very cool. Unfortunately, like there are complications which I'm not telling you about, but like for those, th th that's, that paper have started a very interesting field within machine learning. So if you're interested, please uh, follow the people who cite this paper. Okay, so uh, having shown you these examples, I wanna do one last thing. I wanna tell you about one specific approach which allows, which, which is uh, applicable in quite a few cases and which can, uh, which is the way to get this analytical algorithmic derivatives with respect to algorithm. That's kind of, if this can be applied to your task, then you can differentiate your algorithm analytically, which is nice, which can give you efficient code. Okay, so basically, uh, what, do we do, what do we need to do to, to use this? We need to interpret our algorithm is, as a, the implicit layer. So basically, what's an implicit layer? Like first, uh, explicit layer, that's a standard layer of neural network. So basically, we have input x, we have our layer function f, and we are computing this function on this input, and this gives us the output y. And if, if that's implicit layer, we don't have this function f, and we have our function, uh, we have uh, y of x defined as a solution to a system of equations. So basically, uh, the layer is defined implicitly through system of equations. So basically, and uh, viewing the algorithm as the implicit layer is uh, to, to do that, we need to have uh, our algorithm solving this system of uh, equations. And th this appears in many different cases because many algorithms are solving some equations. So basically, if uh, that's the case, then uh, we can do all these uh, manipulations. Okay, now, if we have this system of uh, equations, H, how do, we, how do we do backprop? How do we compute the gradients? So for this, there is like a very specific recipe, which is like uh, maybe hundreds of years old, uh, but I'm anyway um, showing you how to do this. So basically, uh, what the first step is to take the derivative of this uh, equations with respect to our variable x. So basically, on the right is just the derivative of the equation. On the left hand side is just the derivative of uh, function h with respect to x. And on the right hand side, we, we have zero and derivative uh, of zero with respect to anything is zero. So we have zero here on the right hand side as well. The next step is to apply uh, the um, the rule of differentiating the, the complicated functions to get the, uh, the, the, which is a chain rule. So basically to get the, the derivative, to write the derivative uh, using its component. So here we have a partial derivative of h with respect to x. Then we have a partial derivative of h with respect to its second argument, y. And then we have a derivative of y with respect to x. So basically uh, these things, uh, that's exactly what we want to compute, the derivative of y with respect to x. And we can just do this by solving this uh, algebraically. So basically we take the matrix inverse of this and uh, multiply this by, uh, by this, and that's it. So basically note that this, 
uh, this uh, partial derivatives are t can be typically computed with the automatic differentiation, in the sense that if we are defining our layer through system of equations, then probably we have explicit, uh, explicit way to writing down these equations. And if we have this, then we can just apply automatic di differentiation to get all the partial derivatives. And so basically, uh, what are the catches? What do we need to compute this? So the first problem is that this Jacobian, this uh, partial derivative of H with respect to Y, can be non-invertible. So if it's a bit non-invertible, then we can just add a bit of regularization, and this can help, this can provide us robust solution. But if it is completely non-invertible, then uh, probably our equations are not defining like a continuous function, and then uh, this approach cannot be applied uh, to begin with. Okay, and the... the Another catch is that solving this might be computationally expensive because instead of just matrix, regular matrix multiplication in the backward pass, we now need to compute uh, matrix inverse, which might be hard. But usually, uh, what, what people usually do is that, what's usually the case is that if you have a method to solve this uh, system of equations, and if you're writing down these equations, then probably like, you have uh, some ways to tackle those. And usually, uh, if you have that, then that method is, uh, can be adapted to solve this as well, and to get you the derivative uh, of all these multiplications um, efficiently. Now I'll go to some examples of these implicit layers, how those uh, have been applied recently. Because uh, although like, this technique to differentiate uh, is uh, known for, uh, for long, only recently it has come to neural networks, uh, in the modern era of neural networks, and people have tried actually embed, have started embedding those into bigger networks. So basically, examples. So uh, first example is a big family of methods uh, called differentiable optimization. Uh, this, is, this comes from this paper of, by uh, Brandon Amos and Zika Calder of two years ago. And it's a very nice paper. If you're interested in the topic uh, in more details, I really recommend reading that. So basically, what's it about? It's about using, uh, it's about interpreting an optimization problem as an implicit layer and uh, plugging this optimization problems into networks as layers, as implicit layers. So consider, uh, the example they consider, and the example we'll consider now, is a quadratic program, an optimization of quadratic function under constraints. So basically what we have here, we have our input x, and we want to define an implicit, uh, an implicit layer as a solution of the following quadratic minimization problem. So in our objective, uh, we have a qu quadratic term and a linear term, where both the matrix of uh, the quadratic term and the vector of the linear term are defined as the functions of our input. You can think of those as uh, some neural networks that compute the parameters. We also have uh, all the parameters in, in, inside equality and inequality constraints, uh, depending on this input, which can be like arbitrary, uh, we can have big neural networks living inside. So basically, and uh, you've already seen an example of a problem like this, which was image denoising. There we had an optimization problem, which was almost QP. And basically, same uh, we've, um, we've seen how this problem was different, different, this layer was differentiated with the unrolling iterations, but, and that's an alternative operation, which is, more, which is claimed to be way more efficient, differentiating this uh, algorithmically. Okay, so now that's an optimization problem. But to do the implicit layer, we need the system of equations. Uh, luckily, we have, we know uh, how, what should be the system of equations to define uh, the solution of this problem. And that's KKT conditions. So basically, if we write all the equations of the KKT conditions, the, this one is a derivative of the Lagrangian, which is a stationarity constraint. Then this is a primal feasibility constraint, which says that uh, this uh, equality constraint is true. And this is, uh, those are the like complementary slackness equations. And note that if we know how to solve this optimization problem, and uh, if we are talking about this, then we probably like, have some algorithm to do that. There are numerous uh, toolboxes to do that as well. Then we can easily get all the y's. And if we have all the y's, what's left is just a system of linear equations which can be like, easily solved. So basically, if we have this 
solution of this at the forward pass, then we can get uh, all this solution of this system equations as well. And we can use all the machinery I've talked about to get the, the derivatives. Now a bit more interesting examples, maybe not more interesting, also some also interesting examples of uh, where these implicit layers have been applied. Here I'm not going to give you any details, I'll just name a few like topics uh, where this was used, a few areas. So first, uh, it's a SATnet, that's, the, uh, that's a discrete optimization problem of uh, satisfiability, SAT, standard problem in discrete optimization. So basically uh, what these people di did, they uh, used the relaxation of a discrete optimization problem, uh, arrived at a continuous optimization problem and used this, the same technique to differentiate through that continuous optimization problem. And that worked well, they were obtaining something, some interesting results here. Another example uh, is uh, a deep equilibrium models. So these models uh, are defined as a repeated usage of, uh, uh, of layers like residual uh, re blocks of residual blocks in ResNets or like layers of transformer models where the same layer can be stacked many times with the same parameters. And then they define the implicit layer as a, as a uh, a task of finding a stationarity point of this, uh, of using the, this one of these layers many times. And they say, uh, this paper claims that basically using the layer this way allows to save, solve, to save a lot of GPU memory and to allow us to run much bigger models uh, than without this. My final example is uh, a bit of a different flavor and that's differentiable physics engine. So basically, in the, when we are modeling physics, we have a lot of equations that do, which, which are phys the laws of physics. And basically, using these uh, laws gives us a system of equations that can be differentiated with this approach. And we can define, we can use, we can define a, a, an implicit layer, which is, uh, say, a renderer under, phys under, physics, under physics laws. Okay, so here like uh, I'm almost done. Uh, my last slide, conclusion. So I've talked to you about three ways of uh, combining algorithms and neural network. The first way I referred to as structured pooling. Uh, the second way is unrolling iteration. And the final way is analytical or algorithmic uh, differentiation. So basically in the first approach, uh, we are just running the algorithm to choose activations and uh, we just, uh, at the backward pass, we are only using the chosen activations and we don't care at all how those activations were chosen. This means, on, on the bad side, this limits a bit the applicability of the method, so it's only applicable to like uh, pooling, pooling of uh, different sorts. But on the good side, yeah, the, the good thing is that the link between the implementation of the network and implementation of the algorithm can be very weak, we just need to call the algorithm and get the result. This means that we can build a system which relies on existing software for the algorithm. We don't have to necessarily build something new. So the second approach is uh, opposite in this sense. We have to take the algorithm, implement this in the, uh, in the, in the same system as our neural network, but then the, the autograd takes care about computing the gradients. And this thing is very general and can be uh, can be used to differentiate many different kinds of algorithms. Specifically, it works specifically well with uh, all the uh, linear algebra and um, uh, optimization, iterative optimization methods. And the final, uh, the final approach is analytical algorithmic differentiation. Like here, basically what we need to do is to, is to derive a specific algorithm to compute the gradients. So when the, this is extra work, sometimes this is very hard, but if we can do this, then we are likely to arrive at very efficient, uh, memory efficient, runtime efficient solution for the derivatives. Okay, but uh, basically the, the point is that you, you probably want to use the last approach only when you are really sure that you need that, when you are sure that your model would work. Okay. So basically, wh wh why do we need to do this? Why, why, do, why do I care about all these uh, approaches? So with these approaches, we can, 
do we can get benefits from both sides, from the algorithms and uh, from the networks. So we can get better networks. We can, by, if, by applying these techniques, we can enrich our library of available layers and get new layers. And the more layers, the better. So we can uh, we have a larger toolbox of building models. And on another side, we can get learnable algorithms, which might be uh, which might be very useful in the sense that if you already have an algorithm, algorithm that works, but then there is a problem of setting some parameters, such as uh, prior over natural images, then we might just learn that from data, and uh, we might combine the, the power of uh, developed te of uh, existing techniques and uh, some the power of learning parameters. Okay, so now uh, I'll talk a bit about open problems, about what's left, what is hard. Uh, what are the limitations of all these techniques? So the biggest and the, the hardest limitation is that uh, those techniques are not really applicable uh, in the settings where the control flow of the algorithm itself depends on data. For example, if we have if we have conditions, if we have uh, while loops in the sense that number of iterations of the loop depends on the data itself, and then uh, it's, um, it, it, those situations are hard. So basically, what, what, what are the approaches to, existing approaches to deal with them? We can either do like, uh, like we did for max pooling, just ignore all the places which are non-differentiable and use the, the one path that was run and differentiate through that. This, this, this can work, but this is not really learning the conditions. And if those are very important for the algorithm, then uh, it would do, just won't be learned. Another way to go is to use some attention type mechanism and to go through all the paths simultaneously. But this can be computationally very expensive because uh, instead of using just one path, you have to run all. And then you can do some high, something in between, like sample like a few possibilities, try them. But then uh, the techniques become uh, very, the variance can go very high and those become, become un uh, unreliable. So basically that's an open area of research. It's related to say neural architecture search and other tasks like that. Okay, so basically uh, another problem that uh, can appear and that often appears is that when you stick algorithm with neural network, you get some convergence issues in, in the sense that training, uh, training stochastic optimization stops converging. And it becomes much harder to tune hyperparameters on that. Because uh, normally, like uh, the standard neural network architectures come with uh, default parameters, which are supposed to work well, and we tune only like a couple of them, not, not even, don't even try to tune all of them. And here, like we might, by adding such like, complicated layers, we might be changing the properties of the function completely, and uh, the existing hyperparameters might not work well anymore. And tuning hyperparameters is uh, like a magic uh, of deep learning. So it might be hard. Okay, and so basically, this, using these methods can often faces uh, certain bottlenecks. So basically one bottleneck, especially for unrolling the iteration, is the amount of GPU memory. So basically because you need to store all the intermediate activations, you cannot unroll too many iterations. And that's, that's uh, often the limitation of the approach. And another thing that using the algorithm at the forward pass uh, might hurt your inference speed in a sense that you actually need to run your algorithm, and that takes time. And so basically, if your algorithm is slow, then your neural network pipeline will be like very slow as well. And sometimes this is a disaster, and this, this means that you just cannot do it. And this can be even... Th this can be... Uh, this can be tricky in a sense that your algorithm is kind of fast, but you cannot use the GPU power in it. It's not implement... It's not it doesn't go well with GPUs, and then uh, your neural network is fast on GPUs, but then you have to wait while algo and your GPU is not used. And that's it, that raises tricky engineering questions. Okay, so basically that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for attention.